Thanks, everyone. Well, I'm hoping we're going to have fun and that I'll be able to give you some practical tools that you can use with your kids. Question for you, how many of you have kids who have some kind of GI issue? Okay, the studies that we have on autism and GI issues go somewhere between 9% and 82%. And I would say that in this room, we're more around 82%. Um, and so we can't always believe what the studies tell us. <laughs> uh, you're going to be hearing a lot today, Dr. Herbert and also um, Dr. O'Hara, we're talking really about systems biology. And what I want to say is, you know, when we were kids, we used to sing that song that the ankle bones connected to the leg bone, the leg bones connected, you know? And the truth is, is that medicine focuses on organs and tissues, which are like the, the branches of a tree and the leaves of a tree. But what Dr. Herbert was saying, and what I'm going to say, is that what we need to focus on is the roots of that tree. How do we make sure that our kids are getting the right nutrients? How, do, how are they resting and having fun? Um, what is their skill? What's their skill set? Um, how resilient are they? Are they sleeping? Are they moving? What's going on in their lives? And so it's those foundational principles that we always want to look at. And pretty much all of the most common issues in, in, G, in kids on the spectrum with GI are every possible GI configuration you can imagine. So we've got kids who've got gastric reflux and heartburn. We've got kids who have really failure to thrive. They're not absorbing their nutrients. Any of you have kids who've fallen, started falling off the growth charts? You know, we've got kids who, who aren't absorbing. Kids with irritable bowel syndrome-like symptoms, constipation, diabetes, uh, Constipation, diarrhea, alternating constipation or diarrhea? A few, okay. Um, anybody whose child has eosinophil esophagitis or gastritis? Okay. Um, sometimes I work with parents who come to the autism meetings because their kids have eosinophilic issues but they're not autistic. And so, but they say, but all the same principles apply. So they come anyway. And we have um, digestive issues. And so we've got a lot of different issues in of our kids. This is one graph that I put together um, about GI issues. Helena um, et al. looked at people and they said, wow, 91% of the kids that they queried who were on the autistic spectrum had some sort of GI issue. Their siblings had 25% of their siblings also had GI issues, but none of the controls. Um, enterocolitis was, was an inflammation of the mucous membranes and the skin in the colon itself, 88%. Esophagitis, which is an inflammation in the esophagus, 69%. Abdominal pain, 69%. And sometimes you'll see your child be, will, how do your kids tell you that they're in pain? They're hanging over furniture. They're, they're curling up into little balls. They're rocking. You know, some of those behaviors we think are stimming are really about, I'm in pain, but I don't know how to tell you I'm in pain. Because in kids, symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome are usually, it's not called IBS in kids. It's called re recurring abdominal pain. And so our kids are in pain and they do postures that we might think are, that they're just being weird, but think about them and say, could this be because their tummy hurts? Um, if, you, if your throat hurt, how interested would you be in eating a lot of different foods? Not very interested. I wouldn't be interested. My throat's inflamed. I've got a sore throat. Do I want to eat? No, I don't want to eat. I want soup. I want soothing stuff. 
We've got kids with um, gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, diarrhea, constipation, gas, abnormal be um, bowel movements. We just have a lot of different issues. And also, I want to point out that we, we also have, from this study by Horvath and, and colleagues, is that, that what we find is that our kids are not digesting carbohydrates very well. And if we could imagine what the inside of the digestive system looks like, imagine a towel. And imagine how a towel has all those little tiny loops, right? Those little tiny loops in the digestive system will be called villi. I don't think I put a picture in. I'm sorry if I didn't. But anyway, they're called villi. And they're these little tiny loops. And on those little loops are little hair-like things called microvilli. And it's on those fringes of the microvilli that we absorb carbohydrates like lactose and disaccharide enzymes and where we um, absorb sugars and carbohydrates. And if those little villi, those little microvilli are damaged or blunted for any reason, like an infection or too much stress or too many medications or um, eating the wrong foods, eating gluten, for example, what happens is that those little microvilli get damaged a little bit, and then our kids aren't able to absorb and utilize carbohydrates very well. Any of your kids get gas and bloating? Any of your kids on enzymes? Yay, okay. So, so what we see is that they're not absorbing. What we also see is that they have um, pancreatic dysfunction, which is a fancy way of saying that that their pancreas, pancreas isn't putting out enzymes as well as it should be. And the reason for that is that on those tippy tops of those little microvilli, those little hair-like things on the towel, what we've got is we've got a place where we make an enzyme called chymotrypsin. And that chymotrypsin sends a message to the pancreas and says, hey, secrete enzymes, we need enzymes now. But again, if those little hair-like microvilli, if they're not working exactly right, then what happens is that the pancreas never gets the message. It's like a broken phone line. It's like having your cable down or your internet down. There's no message that's going through. So the pancreas doesn't know what's going on, which is why digestive enzymes are so important in our kids. And here's the kid, the picky eater, right? Here's the kid who says, I'm not eating that. And the reason why is because they might have inflammation all the way through their gut. All the way through their gut. They don't want to eat. They're smart. You have to realize that our kids are smart. They are telling us what they need by doing funny things. And we have to be detectives to try to figure out what they're trying to tell us. And often what they're trying to tell us is, I'm not eating that because I don't feel good when I eat that. There's something that bothers me. Now, one of the reasons why I love digestion so much is because digestion is about everything. You heard this morning about mitochondria. Mitochondria are those little energy factories in our cells that produce energy and, and heat so that they keep our body at 98.6 degrees and that we are, have enough energy to get out of bed and we feel really good and so those mitochondria are really important. But how do those mitochondria get the nutrients that they need? Those mitochondria, in order to make energy, they need B vitamins, zinc, magnesium, manganese. Um, they need all these different nutrients, CoQ10. And how do we actually get those nutrients? We get those nutrients from our food. Although, if you look at at least American surveys, about 80% of people don't get most of those nutrients from their food because they're eating highly processed food. And so it's like, wow. So the mitochondria can't work if they don't have the right nutrients. But where do we get those nutrients? We get the nutrients from food. And what Dr. Herbert said this morning, 
was that every cell in our body is made of the food that we eat. Well, the purpose of digestion is to get nutrients to every single cell. So if digestion isn't working right, your mitochondria don't work right, your immune system doesn't work right, your um, neurological system doesn't right, look right, nothing works right if you don't get all the nutrients to the cells. The other thing that I love about the digestive system is that two-thirds of our immune system is in the gut. It's in the digestive system. And when you think about, well, why would that be? Why is that? It's because every day we take pounds of stuff that we call food and we put it in our mouth and our body has to decide, is this, do I want to be like this? Is this who I am? Because if this isn't who I want to be, I'm going to have immune response to it. And some of you have probably seen that. How many of you have your kids on some kind of special diet? And has that diet made any difference? Okay. So, so you know, sometimes the things that we'll do in digestion or with diet will significantly help our kids. And they'll wake up and they'll be more neurotypical. Sometimes when we work on digestion, what we do is we improve quality of life so that your child isn't having diarrhea, pain, inflammation. And if you're not putting out a fire over here, it gives your, your child a, the chance and opportunity to work on a different fire. Because if your roof is on fire, you don't have time for the little fire that you caused in your kitchen when you were making something. So we, you know, it helps. So I don't know how far this is going to help your child, but I know that it's going to help quality of life. And our digestion works. Oh, the other thing that I love about the digestive system is that we, our nervous system is also in the digestive system. We make glial cells and there are tons of them and we make serotonin and dopamine and we make all of our neurotransmitters in the gut in much larger quantities than we make in the brain and the nervous system. And so the digestive system is really the beginning place because it's really the river of life. If we don't know, if we don't know where, if we can't get those nutrients to the cells, if we can't get the waste out of the cells, then we're not going to feel well. None of us. So we're going to spend a lot of time, you're going to hear from Vicki after I speak, talking about food and specific diets. We spend a lot of time talking about what we're eating. But if we can't digest those foods, then it doesn't matter what we're eating. Hence enzymes and hydrochloric acid and other kinds of things that we could use. If we can't absorb those nutrients well into our bloodstream, then we're going to feel tired or we're going to have food sensitivities or we're going to have other issues. If we can't take those nutrients into our cells and utilize them, then the whole thing was for nothing. And finally, we have to be able to excrete waste. And a lot of our kids have liver issues. They have um, bowel issues and they're not excreting well. And any of your kids have skin issues? Skin, think not excreting waste that well, think digestion, think diet. So this is a slide, you probably can't actually read it, but I think it's blown up in, in your materials. And basically, all, what I wanted to show you here was that what you've got is that behave, you can start with behavioral changes, and behavioral changes can affect the brain, which alters the gut. And it causes inflammation, which ch changes the gut bacteria and causes low-grade inflammation, which makes us have GI symptoms. So it could start in your brain. But the other thing is that you could have symptoms in your gut. You could, you could have a bacterial infection or dysbiosis or fungal infection, which everyone was really quick to, to point out on Nancy's slide. You'd have an infection that can cause inflammation in the brain and behavior changes, which will, and the low-grade inflammation will also cause GI symptoms. And we see this gut-brain connection because they're, inter, they're interwoven, and often the gut is called the second brain. 
because if there's a lot more information that goes from the gut to the brain than goes from the brain to the gut. So we want to make sure that it's all in balance. So this is about irritable bowel syndrome, but we find irritable bowel syndrome in about 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. population, and um, 70 to 90 percent of people who have irritable bowel have some kind of psychiatric issue. They have um, irritable bowel, you know, the, the, anyway, they have either 19 percent of them have schizophrenia, 29 percent of the people who have IBS have major depression, and 46 percent of the people with IBS have panic disorder. So this isn't about our kids with autism, but if your kid has bowel issues, think brain issues. And inflammation of the gut, it's like when we have inflammation, and we've been hearing things, you've been hearing things about inflammatory cytokines and NF-kappa B and, and uh, IL, interleukins, IL-6, and you know, all these different inflammatory markers. It doesn't matter whether we're talking in your toe or your gut or your brain or your ovaries or wherever, the mechanisms are the same. Our body only has so many ways of reacting to inflammation. And so when, if, you know how like when you have the flu, how do you feel when you have the flu? You feel like your brain says, I'm going to get up and go to work. Then you get out of bed and you go, I'm delusional. There's no way I can go to work because I feel horrible. And what, one of the things that happens is we also start getting this feeling like, I don't want to do anything. I feel terrible. I don't want to do anything. Well, and sometimes we feel depressed even. All of that is a result of this inflammation, this cytokine storm that's helping us to heal from the flu, but it's how we feel. And our kids are in this cytokine storm all the time. A lot of them, they're inflamed. Their brains are inflamed, their guts are inflamed. And how they feel is terrible. Kind of like how you feel when you have the flu. So you want to kind of think about that um, anyway. And there's all kinds of systemic disturbances that we see in our kids um, who have GI issues. So we see sleep issues, we see irritability, we see more behavioral problems. We see skin problems, we see asthma and sinus, um, ear, repeated ear infections. Um, about a quarter of our kids have GERD-like symptoms, which means they have heartburn or they have inflammation in their esophagus or, you know, it's, it, they don't feel good, they don't want to eat. They're, it's one of the reasons why they're really picky eaters. And how we see that is maybe they have hoarseness or asthma or sleep problems or a chronic cough or a chronic sore throat or ear infections um, and sometimes you see it as a really slow heart rate which I don't know why. You can also see it as dental erosion. Any of you noticing that your kids teeth are eroding? One, that's one of the classic signs of celiac disease. Um, so uh, there's some people that's their only symptom. So uh, with reflux, so the first thing that I think of when I'm working with a child who has gastric reflux, and I remember this, my, my first son is 27 now, but I remember sitting at a restaurant with friends when he was about three months old, and he projectile vomited across the table at my friend, who was a guy. Wasn't really great. Um, but, but, you know, I took him in, and I, I got a little bit of a... a osteopathic adjustment done on him and all that kind of GERD-like, colicky-like stuff just went away. Um, it's also important that our kids chew, so making meals a relaxing time really helps. I know that it can be stressful, but helping them to relax, so if it helps them, and I hate to say it, but if it helps them to watch TV because they're more relaxed and they can wa eat over a period of an hour, or 45 minutes, we're not going to be like, we got to go to the next thing, we got to do the next thing, you know? Um, just let them relax while they eat. 
Acupuncture can also be really useful, and, and with a lot of kids, acupuncturists will use tapping or they'll use, um, they don't have to use needles. So um, stress management, stress is an enormous player in, in GERD. And then you can do things like having them chew on a licorice stick, you know, like a, a piece of licorice or giving them licorice tea or giving them some DGL licorice to chew on, which is sweet and tastes yummy. Um, aloe vera, slippery elm, mallow, there are supplements that have all of these things in them, but also these are very soothing and you can give them to your child as teas or um, something that they can do. And then in our kids, remember I said that we have inflammation that can go anywhere in here. So the first place to start to lower inflammation in our kids is with food. Food is our most intimate contact with our external world because we are taking in all this stuff every day and saying, I want to be just like you. So if we're giving ki our kids food that's inflammatory, they're going to be inflamed. And the standard American diet is an inflammatory diet devoid of most nutrients and most people just aren't getting what they need. Um, also, I use an elimination diet and it's in your handouts. It's got recipes and shopping lists and um, tips and pointers. But how it looks is that it, it pretty much what your kids can eat is non-gluten containing grains like rice or quinoa, um, millet, buckwheat. They can have fish and chicken. They can have um, fruits and vegetables, oils, herbs and spices. Just try that. It's amazing. You know, we, we see a lot of change in our kids just from gluten casein, but when we take out food additives and soy and colorings and sugar and um, some of the eggs and dairy, you know, some of the other inflammatory foods, we do a lot better. And then I use a lot of probiotics with kids, both in food. Any of you making cultured foods, making your own yogurt or sauerkraut or kimchi, great, you know? And how many of your kids are taking probiotics? Yay, okay? Because that gut microbiome, what I can say is we don't know that much about it. But what we do know is that it's disordered in our kids and we'll get there. And then we can use things like fish oil and turmeric and curcumin and cook with herbs and spices. Give your kids some, a little bit of diluted cherry juice or give them cherries when they're in season or pomegranate or pomegranate juice. All of these are very anti-inflammatory. And again, soothing herbs like slippery elm, aloe, mallow, and DGL. And here's just, you know, this is kind of an anti-inflammatory diet. You want to add herbs and spices fruits, vegetables, beans, peas. So this is um, something that, that colleagues and I put together at the Institute for Functional Medicine, and it's how do we assess, really, digestive issues. And there's a few different things, and I'm going to kind of run through all of these different issues. The first thing is digestion and absorption, which... Um, as I said before, a lot of our kids don't have enough enzyme activity and they're not getting the nutrients to their cells. We also have kids with leaky gut. Maybe 20 or 30 percent of our kids have leaky gut, um, which is that food molecules, toxins, bacteria, and microbes are getting into the bloodstream that should never get in there. Well, we don't want that. And then the gut microbiome, which is we each have about three and a half to four and a half pounds of bacteria in, bacteria in, and fungi in our digestive system. And these are 10 times more numerous than the cells in our body. And 99% of the DNA that's in your body and my body is made from bacteria. So you kind of wonder who hosts who. And the NIH is doing huge research right now to look at this microbiomes, the microbiome in our mouth, the ones on our skin, the ones in our genital urinary system, the ones in our gut, the, um, the ones in our nose and lungs, to say what kind of bacteria should be there and what shouldn't be there. And when we give our kids probiotics or we give them cultured and fermented foods, we start giving messages 
that are anti-inflammatory because the main function of probiotics is to regulate the immune system. Also does a lot of other things along the way, but that's its main function in making B vitamins and making vitamin K and protecting us against cancer and all kinds of other things. And our kids have a disordered um, uh, microbiome. We've talked about inflammation and immune, and then I talked about that the nervous system is in the gut. So we want to look in all those areas. And what I also want to say is the gut makes over 32 hormones. So the gut is neurological, it's immunological, it's hormone, it's got everything. It's a pretty interesting, pretty interesting. So, I, um, so what we want to do, and you've heard this a lot, you want to take away anything that doesn't belong. You want to add things that do belong, like nutrients and good foods and, and uh, probiotics and enzymes. You want to re-inoculate with probiotic-rich foods and maybe giving probiotics. You want to give repair substances to help your child repair and reduce inflammation. And then you want to see what the new balance is and where you are from there. And then you start all over again when you have the energy, right? Because this is a process. So, um, and that for mom and dad and kids. So it's hard to stay in balance, you know, stand on one foot all the time. It's hard. So we want to take some deep breaths. So with digestion and absorption, um, I think I already just kind of talked about this, but what we want to add is enzymes, we want to look at um, how well the parietal cells are working because um, a lot of our kids need vitamin B12. Any of your kids need B12? You know, a lot of our kids need vitamin B12 because the parietal cells in the stomach aren't making enough intrinsic factor and, um, and we need that to couple with it to bring the vitamin B12 into the body. And so looking at, as uh, Dr. Nancy was saying, looking at um, methylmalonic acid levels in the blood give us, or in, ur in urine from organic acid testing give us information about vitamin B12. We need fiber to keep things moving. Um, some of our kids may need um, support to help them make hydrochloric acid, and some of our kids may need bile support. So I've never seen a study on low hydrochloric acid levels in kids. However, these are the things that happen when our, our hydrochloric acid levels are low. And hydrochloric acid is this very strong acid that's in our stomach. It's at a pH of 1 to 2 and when it's right, which means that it would burn our skin. So we have all this mucus that coats our stomach and helps protect it so that we don't get ulcers and burn holes in our stomach from this hydrochloric acid. And you say, so why would the body do this? This seems pretty crazy. Well, it's part of our immune system. Because if we take in parasites or candida or bacteria from our food and you put it in a big acid solution, it should help break that down. And so it's our first defense against infection. Okay, so that's one. Second thing is that our amino acids can be up to 20,000, our protein can be 20,000 amino acids long. And so the hydrochloric acid starts cleaving that into smaller pieces so that your pancreas doesn't have to work so hard. And the final thing that's so critical about the hydrochloric acid is that when the contents of our stomach move from our stomach and then into our small intestine, that acid for the first 12 to 15 inches of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum, that acid allows us to absorb minerals. Calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, iron. Any of your kids have mineral imbalances? Okay, so when I look at all of this, when I look at all this, I go, wow, our kids have yeast. Our kids have bacterial infections. Our kids have low B6 and B12. They have low minerals. Um, they're not absorbing their nutrients well. I go, I think a lot of our kids have hydrochloric acid insufficiency. Now, do we want to necessarily give hydrochloric acid to kids who can't tell us that it's burning their stomach? No. Okay? So some of the things that I like to do, one, again, stress management, acupuncture, 
And one of the foods that I love is this particularly odd food. It's called an umeboshi plum. Have any of you ever eaten one? Don't think plum. Think more like pickle or olive. You know, they have kind of an unusual flavor. They're salty, they're pickled, they're in brine, and they calm down the belly so amazingly. And what I would say is buy some at、um, a health food store because you can get them in Asian grocery stores or in the Asian section of a grocery store, but they've got red dye in them. So you want ones that don't have red dye. And just put a little bowl out and see if your child will eat these. Because they taste really weird. There are times in my life it's like this tastes too weird. I'm not eating it. But what I find is that in myself and in my clients is that when we need them, we really like how they taste, and they help support stomach acid. You can also try Swedish bitters. You can also try a little bit of diluted vinegar. You can put a little vinegar in whatever you're giving your child to drink, and then there's something called gentian root. Um, and again, in the, one of the early studies, seventy-five percent of our kids have pancreatic issues. Fifty-eight percent of our kids have trouble digesting carbohydrates. So、um, you might see symptoms. The, one of the main things that you'll start seeing is anybody see、um, undigested food in your kid's poop?、And、go, wow! We're not supposed to see that. If you see it in yours, you're also not supposed to see that either, you know. But, but anyway, I think really almost all of our kids would really benefit from taking enzymes. You can do different kinds of testing to see if your child needs enzymes. They're in stool testing. What you'll see is it'll be either measured as pancreatic elastase, elastase one, or chymotrypsin. So, any of you done a comprehensive stool analysis? So, if you look there, what you're looking for is levels 400 or more for elastase one or、um, pancreatic elastase.、Um, if they're less than that, your kids need to be supplemented with enzymes. And then empirically, we see undigested food in their stool. It's a big sign. You don't have to spend any money. You just got to look at poop. So、um, digestive enzymes, we have different ones that break down fats. They're called lipase. We have ones that break down protein. They're called protease. We have amylases that break down starch. And a good digestive enzyme will help break down all of these. There are also enzymes that help to break down some of the glutens,、um, but they're not perfected yet. And so, giving your child an en- a digestive enzyme with food really helpful.、Um, oh well, this is really out of sync. Okay, so in, I'm talking about probiotics、um, in babies. When we breastfeed, we have probiotic bacteria in our breast milk, and and also when. Babies suck on their fingers or toes. Suck on your finger or toe. When they start eating food, it introduces bacteria in, and it goes into their gut and it sets up their immune system for life. We can disrupt that in some babies almost permanently by giving them something that would wipe out their good bacteria sometime in the first six months of their life for a week or more. Can you think of anything that might do that? Antibiotics, vaccines, maybe you know. But antibiotics, and it used to be thought that that doing that even once within the first six months or a year of a child's life, that they would never rebound. Now we've got a little bit more optimistic information saying it looks like you know that gut can repair itself and we can do that. But we set up the immune system of a baby in the first two years of life, and we do that by setting up this gut microbiome because that's where most of the immune system is. And so when babies are born, the first few months they're making mostly Bifidus infantis, which is、um, a probiotic bacteria. But then, when we start giving them food, they start getting more,、um, more adult-like probiotic balance. And、um, even babies who were、uh, bottle-fed start catching up 
they start catching up. It takes them a little a bit longer, but they do. And also babies who've had a C-section, they don't go through that, that birth canal. They don't go through the vagina, which is loaded with bacteria that helps set it up. And even more tragic, what we're doing is giving, is we're sterilizing women's vaginas sometimes before birth. And it's like, why are we, anyway. So, um, probiotic supplements, I think they're like the wild frontier. That's what I, how, how I think about them because we don't totally know what we're doing. Give us another five or ten years and we'll know more. But probiotics are a bacteria that has a specific known benefit. Specific known benefit. And in our gut, most of what's there are what we call commensals. We don't really know what they do. They modulate the immune system. They modulate metabolism. They modulate inflammation, but we don't know enough. And so what the new science of the gut microbiome is more like, well, let's be less specific and let's just try to influence this whole thing as a whole. We heard last night from Ken Cook from the Environmental Working Group, we heard from him how tiny amounts of something can have tremendous effects. And these probiotics, if you give the right probiotics in the right amounts, they have enormous effects on how your child behaves. So you want to start with really small doses or if you're using cultured and fermented foods, just a little bit at a time. And then you want to start increasing little bits. If my child had ulcerative colitis, I would want to use a lot. If my child didn't really seem to have any digestive issues, I'd probably want to use a little, like one to three billion microorganisms a day. Sometimes if I'm working with a child who's really inflamed, I'll use a specific probiotic called um, Lactobacillus plantarum because it's very, very soothing and I'll use it in very low doses, maybe three billion colony forming units a day. Little tiny amounts. If you're planning on having more kids, starting by giving them um, Bifidus infantis and giving them a supplement that has probiotics from the very be moment they're born, well, maybe the first day anyway. Moms can just put a little bit on their nipple, the baby will suck it off, or you can just take your finger and put it in the jar, and whatever comes out, that's enough. Just have your baby suck on your finger. It's amazing because in studies so far what we know is that probiotic bacteria given from birth for the first even three months of life reduces eczema and allergy and asthma by 50% even after two years. Because remember we're setting up this gut microbiome. Um, so um, we're going to be hearing more and more about this gut microbiome. Um, as I said before, we've got a huge amount of genes there. We've got a lot of metabolic activity. And what we're finding is that, that they live in communities. So all of us have a gut microbiome, and we have a mouth microbiome, and we have a skin microbiome. And we all have these. And they, they're in biofilms. They're in these communities. And I like to think of them as like corporations. You know, like it's a corporation. And so any of you have kids that you've had to give antibiotics to or antimicrobial herbs or something? Do they get better for a little while? Do they stay as well? Not always. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And it depends on what's happening. So when we have kids with chronic infections, we need to give them products, enzymes, and, and things that help get into this microbiome layer so they don't keep getting chronic infections. And again, we want to re-inoculate with probiotics, but also with food. Things like poi and curds and whey, and, which is yogurt or, or coconut kefir or um, we want to use things like miso soup if they're eating soy. Um, it, we want to have prebiotics like honey. We want, we want prebiotics like asparagus and green tea, onions. And then when we look at the microbiome of kids on the spectrum, what we see is that it's imbalanced. They have a lot more bacteroidetes in comparison to Firmicutes which are big families of microbes. 
We also see this in obese people. We see that this in people with Alzheimer's. Is it just a general sign of inflammation? We don't know, but we know that it's disordered. So this is from the autism research parent studies. And one of the most important tools that people have used for our kids is antifungals. Any of you tried antifungals, candida diets? Did it make a difference? Oh, yeah. I'm hearing, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is one of the biggest things that we can do for our kids. Our kids have infection. Also, our kids have this abdominal pain, which is called in adults IBS. And in most of medicine, what we do is we just kind of say, well, IBS is we need more fiber. We need more fiber, and that's what's causing it. But I think it's really important to look and say, is it lactose intolerance? Is it celiac disease? Is it gluten intolerance? Is it candidiasis? Is it parasites? Is it um, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth? Is it stress? You know, which, I mean, we have to look. Is it just, you've got a constipated kid. Do they just need more magnesium? It's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, one of the, some of the signs of magnesium deficiency, sensitivity to noise. Wow, does that sound like our kids? You know, sense, ir easily irritable, easily overwhelmed constipated. So looking more deeply, don't just take that. Don't just, and as Dr. O'Hara was saying, don't just say, oh, well, my child has digestive issues because they've got autism. No, your child has digestive issues because they have digestive issues. And those may affect the autism. So let's clear them up. And um, in irritable bowel syndrome in adults, what we find is that, that it, uh, probably about two-thirds to three-quarters of people who have irritable bowel syndrome have a, a low-grade infection in their small intestine called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And um, this can be tested with breath testing or with organic acid testing, which is a uro, uh, urine testing. And then you want to treat it with diet, kind of like a low-carbohydrate diet. And um, Vicki Koblener is going to speak about that next. Do you want to give probiotics? You might want to use herbs like golden seal and oil of oregano. Um, you might want to use wormwood. You might want to use other herbs. And then physicians will often treat this with something called rifaximin, which is an antibiotic that only works in the gut. It doesn't work in the lungs or on the skin or other places, but it's, it's kind of amazing. And you can see remarkable changes when you do this kind of a protocol. Um, if your child is bloating, think about low enzymes, think about low hydrochloric acid, and then think about infections. Human cells don't make gas. Bugs make gas. You hearing me? Okay. If, you're, if you or your kid have lots of gas, or at, by the end of the day, you know, we're wearing elastic because our belly gets really big, or you notice your kid's belly gets really big, think bugs. Think infection. And then for constipation, some of the things, you know, like we think about for constipation, well, maybe my child just needs more fiber. Look to their diet. If it's not the right diet, even something like, like um, gluten or cheese can cause a lot of constipation in the right child. Um, think about adding more fiber if they can have fiber. Think about movement. In most of our kids, they're moving, so that's not an issue. They move all the time. Um, think about making sure that they get enough hydration, and then think about, are they on any kind of medication that might be causing them to be constipated? Um, and then you want to differentiate it from irritable bowel syndrome because a lot of people who are really constipated have irritable, have irritable bowel syndrome, which is caused from that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then finally, a lot of kids don't want to poop because they don't want to poop. Okay? They just, they just don't. I mean, like how many of us, we don't want to, go to have a bowel movement at work. You know, we don't want to have a bowel movement at a friend's house or somewhere that's, that's unusual. And so our kids are the same way, and sometimes they just won't poop. They just don't want to do it because unlike urination, 
having a bowel movement is, is um, a two-part system. Like when our bladder is full, we got to go. But when our bowel is full, what happens is one sphincter opens and it's, we get that urge. But then we can wait an hour or two hours or two days. We can ignore it until we're ready to have a bowel movement. The longer we ignore it, the harder that stool gets, the harder it is to get out. And so sometimes our kids just don't want to do it because the more constipated they get, the more it hurts. Having a bowel movement should never hurt. It should be easy. So the more it hurts, the less they want to do it, and then it makes this cycle. Um, so some of the things that really also help with constipation is add magnesium. Magnesium helps with that rhythmic contraction of uh, called peristalsis. It's like a, it's like a snake eating a, a mouse. It just kind of moves everything through, and magnesium helps that happen. Probiotics also help that happen. I don't know that they're here. Um, and then lactose intolerance can cause a lot of constipation, so can glu gluten intolerance or celiac disease. And then those infections, bacterial, fungal, um, and, and parasitic. And um, so I already showed you that one. Candida symptoms, I call it the masquerader. It just can cause pretty much everything. Um, digestive, but also mental. You get people who are confused, they can't think right. Um, blood sugar swings back and forth, so then we get erratic behavior. Um, so, you know, think about yeast. And then for diarrhea, consider an infection. You know, again, diarrhea is not a normal condition, but also consider malabsorption, consider lactose intolerance. Is there something that your child is eating that is causing the diarrhea? And then finally for diarrhea, there is a specific probiotic. It's called Saccharomyces boulardii. It's a yeast, and I'm going to spell it for you. S-A-C-C-H-A-R-O-M-Y-C-E-S, Saccharomyces boulardii, B-O-U-L-A-R-D-I-I. And Saccharomyces boulardii was originally made by a French pharmaceutical company and then it got brought to this country and now a lot of companies are making it. And it's got over 55 years of research for, on diarrhea from all types. So if your kid has clostridium infection, think, think uh, Saccharomyces boulardii. If your child has diarrhea, start giving your child Saccharomyces boulardii three times a day. Um, it's very specific, works amazingly well. Oh, and then, um, oh, and also a lot of times we're not giving our kids sugar, so we might be giving them things with xylitol, mannitol, um, alcohol sugars. And um, so getting rid of those can really help with gas and bloating and diarrhea. Consider food sensitivity, consider gluten intolerance. Um, add cultured foods, fiber, there's all kinds of things that we can try. And ironically, probiotics help with constipation and diarrhea. You know, fiber helps with constipation and diarrhea. So um, again, this is why working with somebody who can help you thread your way through some of this, really useful. Incontinence, I was working with a seven-year-old who who came to see me because she had um, bladder incontinence and bowel incontinence. She was having accidents um, of both at least once a day. Any of your kids incontinent, having bladder, having um, bowel issues? Anyway, um, all we did was an elimination diet, and within two weeks she wasn't having any more uh, urinary um, leaks or incontinence. She wasn't having any any um, issues with, with bowel intolerance either. And she was concerned about that, but her mom was really concerned about the fact that she was a, a terror, a just a horribly behaved child. She was one of four kids, and she was just horrible at home and at school. And within two weeks, she started settling down, and everybody was noticing changes in her behavior. In three months, she was like a different child. So think food. Food is information. Food is information. It makes a huge difference in how our kids behave. And if we can give them the right information for them, 
it makes a big difference. And so we want to restore with food. It's the first thing. We can start looking at all these fancy things and fancy testing and all this stuff, and some of that is really necessary. But if we don't have the diet right, then all that is, you know, subsequent. So you, you'll hear also from Vicki in a moment. She's going to talk about soaking of grains and nuts and seeds and beans. It makes them more digestible. So if your child's eating nuts and seeds, soak them, then dehydrate them in the oven um, because they'll be able to get, utilize them better. Fermentation, I've talked about that. Fermented foods, fermented vegetables, fermented coconut products, poi, all kinds of things really help. Cooking, if your child's really having trouble thriving, sometimes you have to give them all cooked food or all pureed food. Any of you had to do that with your kids? Puree food? Um, and sprouting also allows for a lot more nutrient value. And um, in the old-fashioned way, we had a mortar and pestle. Our new way, we have a high-speed blender. Okay? Sm think smoothies, soups, things. It's a way of loading up with nutrients. And then bone broth, the most gut healing food ever is soup. When you were sick as a kid, did your mom and dad give you soup? Yeah. Why did they give you soup? Because it's an old custom, because it's alkalizing, and because it's loaded with, with minerals, and it's loaded with substances that help repair gut and inflammation. And so soup is so important. And how I use bone broth with the kids is that we cook vegetables in broth. We give them broth to drink as a drink. We may use it as a base for soup. We can throw a cup in a smoothie and use it instead of water. You know, there's lots of ways of getting broth into your child. And this is like, if you only remember one thing that I talked about, make bone broth. If you go onto my site or you go onto YouTube and you look me up, um, you, there's an Innovative Healing channel because my website is innovativehealing.com. If you go to my website, I have a, a, a video of me making chicken soup in a very funky way. Um, it shows you don't have to be a chef, which I'm definitely not. And you can make chicken, get chicken soup going in less than five minutes. I've done demonstrations at conferences, three and a half to four minutes, even with me explaining why it's so good for you and chopping everything up. You can get it in a pot or a crock pot, let it cook all day long, turn it off, let it sit at night, skim off the stuff first thing in the morning, stick it in the freezer or in the fridge. It's really easy to do. And herbal infusions, I think this is a handout that I gave you. If not, you can email me, but I think I did. Herbal infusions for our picky eaters is another way of getting a lot of minerals. If you can make an herbal infusion with nettle, take one ounce of dried nettle and put it in, um, put it in a glass jar, pour boiling water over it, let it sit for 4 to 24 hours, strain it. There's 1,000 milligrams of calcium in there. There's three or 400 milligrams of magnesium in there. If you're thinking about, um, you can use oat straw. Oat straw is very soothing to the gut. Also has a lot of nutrients. Again, these things can be used as basis for smoothies, or you can just, instead of having your child drink water, your child can be drinking herbal infusions. And it's a great way for a picky eater to get nutrients, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. And then we've got all kinds of gut soothing um, foods and teas. So I talked about well-cooked foods, broths, pureed foods, things like okra, cabbage, flax, chia, very soothing. Um, and then for teas, again, chamomile, cardamom, cinnamon, fennel, licorice, lemon balm. These are not only, they're calming to the digestive system, they're calming to our mood. They help with sleep. They just help us feel better. And then we have specific diets, which, which Vicki is going to talk about next. And what I want to show you is that if you just took your child off of wheat, 55% of our kids get better. If you just took your kid off of dairy, 55% of us kids get better. If you just take them off of chocolate, 52% have noticeable improvement. What if you do all of this? What if you do all of this? You think you might get 
80% of our kids feeling better? You know, we don't have data yet on a lot of the diets that we're using, but what we want to do is stop feeding the bugs and start giving healing foods so that we can restore the gut. If we can restore the gut, we can have huge effects on the brain because the gut influences the inflammation that's in our kids' brains. And there's all these different gut healing diets. Vicki's going to talk with you about them. You could go as little as just removing the top two problem foods like gluten and casein. You can do my elimination diet, which you have which is a little bit more intensive. I think it works better. I see better results. And then you do an elimination diet, and then after, except for gluten, after three to five weeks, you can start with singly trying foods and see, how's your child do this? Can they eat it once and be good? Can they eat it two days in a row? Oh, lots of times they do okay with it once, two days in a row, uh-uh. If they don't do well, you start rotating the foods. Keep these diets simple. Don't start buying a lot of packaged foods to make it easy. Cook food at home, freeze it. You know, on a weekend, just take, make a whole oven of food, make a big pot of broth, use it all week. Um, Vicki's going to talk about the gut and psychology syndrome diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, um, the FODMAP diet. There are all different kinds of candida and anti-yeast diets, like the body ecology diet, or a more basic diet, like the William Crook diet. Sometimes you'll find that your child can tolerate a food every once in a while, so you can rotate foods. It's good to have a variety. And then sometimes I actually have to use what's called a medical food, because I have a child who's so compromised that they can't really eat real foods, like the mom over there who's got a child with eosinophilic esophagitis. Sometimes we have to go all the way back and use a medical food that is free amino acids, good quality fats, vitamins and minerals, easy to digest carbohydrates, so that we go all the way back. And I use this for kids who aren't thriving. They're not growing. They're, they're chronically inflamed. So there's lots of different things that we can do. And I hope that each of you took at least one point, just one little thing that you said, huh, maybe I could try that. Maybe that one thing will make a difference. Because if, you know, what we're doing is we're flooding you with so much information. But if you could just take one little point or three or four things home with you from this whole weekend, you're going to do great. Thank you.